All right, good, good evening. And thank you for participating in tonight's 47th District Virtual Town Hall hosted by Representative Deborah Entman. Some of you have submitted questions in advance and we will relay those questions to Representative Entman. You may also submit your questions live in the comments section of the platform you are watching on. Submit your questions now and we will try to answer as many as we can. Before we get started, Representative Entman will give some brief opening remarks. I'll hand it over, her, hand it over to her to get us started. Thank you, Peter. Welcome to the town hall for the 47th district. As you know, Senator Doss has decided that she is not going to uh, run again and um, Representative Sullivan has decided to retire from the legislature. So for now, it seems as though I am the one holding down the fort until we can have great new colleagues elected in the next election. This legislative session was very busy. We had a significant amount of funds that came to us from the federal government to cover some of our costs for COVID. And we also received significant transportation funds. So that has allowed um, members of the legislature to do more in a supplemental budget year um, than has ever been done historically. I look forward to speaking with you more about the transportation projects that are in our district and the other work that we have done um, here in the 47th. But right now I'd like to leave it open for you to ask me questions. Thank you for being here. All right, our first question comes to us from Odalis. Transportation is vital for the elders who have paved the way for us. How can we get them car services that are within means? Thank you for that question. We had um, a historical piece of legislation pass this session that I voted no on because, and I was the only Democrat to do so. And it was an agreement between drivers, the ride share companies like Uber and Lyft and um, the, uh, the union, which was the Teamsters Union that helped to negotiate this along with the legislature. My concerns about this third way agreement were that one, it didn't end surge pricing, and two, we were not thinking about people in our communities who most need a ride, a driving service, and the cost to the individual. We, I think we left out our most vulnerable, including our elders and our parents who may not have access to a vehicle and may have to make more than one stop before they are on their way to their employment. They may leave the house, drop off a child at childcare, drop off a child at school, and then are finally on their way. I had um, learned of one family in my district who was spending approximately $250 a month on rideshare companies because our public transportation system was not accommodating their needs. That is a very large expense for a working family. I believe that if we, the legislature, are going to involve ourselves in negotiations, that they should benefit members of our community. We have Metro Transit, King County Metro Transit in our area, but here on the East Hill, that service has not been restored since we had COVID. And so many of the bus stops that used to be in our district are now closed. And so families are dependent on these rideshare services and they simply cost too much. We can do more, we should do more, and I will be advocating for that working with King County Metro to see what they can do and continuing to talk to the rideshare services about being able to serve all of the families in our area, not just people who have decided that they don't want to have a car. I want them to be able to serve people who can't afford to have a car. Thank you for your question. All right, our next question comes to us from Mary Ann. Do you support returning state budget surpluses to Washington's taxpayers? If not, why not? If so, how do you propose doing it? 
would you support putting a system in place to automatically return future budget surpluses to Washington taxpayers? You know, this is a very difficult question because in Washington state, we have a very regressive tax system and there are many needs that we have. We often hear people say that we should run the government like a business, but businesses are not required to take care of the most vulnerable. That is our seniors and our children, um, people in our mental health facilities, and unfortunately, people who are incarcerated. We have all of those responsibilities that businesses do not have. So we cannot run business like, excuse me, run the state government like a business. And I would say any surpluses that we have, I believe we should say for a rainy day. And I have not been in support of returning money to the taxpayer. Um, I often think about it as if there is some money that we can have for savings, we should use it for that. Um, we know that there are road maintenance and bridge maintenance projects that we need to do. We are always um, need to improve our schools, not just the uh, facilities, but also the technological infrastructure. So as a state government, I don't think that, um, and I know that many people think that we should, but I am not in agreement with returning funds um, when we have a surplus because there are a number of things we could use them for. And I also believe in saving for a rainy day. Excellent. Our next question comes to us from Jason. Can we mandate employers give their employees two different paid leaves, one for sick personal and the other for vacation? Well, you know, it's very interesting. Many employees are, excuse me, many employers are just saying that your personal day is a personal day and you may take it for sick leave. You may take it if you need to take care of a child or take care of a family member. So in some private businesses right now, um, that is already happening. I don't know where you work, um, but it is a trend in the private sector that I'm hoping will um, move to other sectors. Hopefully you will be impacted. All right, our next question comes to us from Matthew. In the Move Ahead Washington Transportation Package, there are portions that would expand Highway 18 to four lanes, but the language from the Issaquah Hobart slash to Raging River, does this mean it will also cover a little over a mile from the Raging River Bridge to I-90, as well as expanding it to four lanes, or it will not cover that portion, having it being two and three lanes, respectively? Let me just, there was a little syntax mix up. Um, let me uh, rephrase that. Will the do you know, will the portion of Highway 18 from Raging River to the I-90 interchange be widened to four lanes um, or will it stay two or three lanes? So it is my understanding that it will be widened. I'm just trying to get some information here so that I give you the correct information. But it is my understanding that yes, we will be widening that section of the road. I have worked with a representative Ramos from the 5th District um, and others to make sure that that occurs because we have safety issues along that area of the road. But yes, it is my understanding that we will be doing that and that will start, looks like later this year. Peter, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. It All is right. So, um, Thank you very much. I always rely on my wonderful staff to make sure that I am not giving you incorrect information. I cannot do it alone and I think they're amazing. So thank you, Peter, for that, making sure that I gave the right information. All right. Excellent. Our next question comes to us from Maya. Uh, what did you do this year to make college more affordable? So first of all, I want to say that we work as a team in the legislature and um, I, I know that I, uh, being on the higher ed committee, we have done a number of things this year that I am very proud of. Um, we have a bill that will give students a um, small stipend of $500 to use for whatever they need it for for school. Um, as we know, things come up 
and often students who don't have support are sometimes wanting to leave school because they can't um, do the things that other students are doing. So we're giving students who are um, who show a need an extra a five hundred dollars, um, and that is um, fun that they can funds that they can use for school, including housing or or buying supplies or whatever they need for school. We also are supporting. Uh, more apprenticeship programs because we see, I see apprenticeships as higher ed. So we are expanding those and funding those and also making sure we are letting students know what a pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs are available and what financial support that you have if you would like to engage in one of those programs. So those are some of the things that we're doing for higher ed this year. This was a supplemental budget year, so we had done a lot in the last session, but I think um, overall the work that we have done for students is wonderful and the increase in funding for students who are attending uh, what we used to call our community colleges, our two-year colleges, has also been historically significant this year. Excellent. Uh, our next question comes to us from Larry. What is the status of the Office of Independent Investigations? So the Office of Independent Investigations, I believe we have recently hired um, leadership for that office, a director, and that director will staff the office. Um, we are working now to establish, based on the legislation, what the director will do and there is going to be a board director those people excuse me have been uh, appointed so it's really now about allowing the director to set up in the parameter of the legislation how his his or how the office will run and that is what we are doing now excellent uh, our next question comes to us uh, from Allison why did you roll back the progress that we made last year on police use of force? Yeah, that was that was a real, Allison, I appreciate that question. It has been a very difficult year, um, this particular session. We had to, when we were advised on two different pieces of legislation, we went with what we were told by our legal advisor, who is the attorney general. What happened and sometimes does um, is the unintended consequences of <clears throat> law enforcement saying that our bills were too ambiguous, our bills were not allowing them to do their job effectively, and so we needed to make some changes. We know that it was disappointing to many members of community, it was disappointing to members of the legislature, and I was disappointed. We made very difficult choices, and we made a choice that said between having no law to affect the use of tactics and to affect when a person is in crisis or having to compromise, um, we decided that we would have to compromise because we would better have a compromise than no law at all. We will continue to monitor law enforcement in our state and we will continue to listen to the advocates who we know are disappointed right now, but we will continue to listen to the advocates and try to work with the advocates and law enforcement to come up with laws that are constitutionally sound and laws that law enforcement can support community in getting behind. We have to work together in order to make all of Washington State safe. I am disappointed in the change, but I am here, I believe, to do the right thing. And these will be long-term uh, changes that we'd like to make in our legislature to influence the actions of law enforcement so that everyone in our state can feel safe. 
Excellent. Our next question comes to us from Sarah. Human trafficking is a major issue in the Puget Sound. What did the legislature do to help victims of human trafficking this year? So in um, so there were a few things that um, we did this year, including a bill that I had the opportunity to work on. We also had a bill from Representative Griffey. Um, Representative Griffey had a bill that would allow signs to be put up in our rest areas so that if someone was being trafficked or in a situation where they needed help, they would be able to see and figure out and, and learn that there was help in Washington state for folks who are victims of human trafficking. And then there was a bill that I proposed when a person is trafficked and they want to testify against their, uh, and they testify, excuse me, against the person who has engaged in putting them into trafficking, they are often in a situation where they are dependent on the person who has victimized them. So what we are doing in our state legislature is allowing them some assistance. When you think of public assistance, that allows them to get housing, food, and access to healthcare and behavioral health as they try to um, put their lives back together and no longer engage in the trafficking activity. And so we pass that piece of legislation as well. There are a number of people, and this is one of the areas where we um, are working together with law enforcement. Many people um, may not know, but I have learned from working with our federal partners that I-5 is a corridor for trafficking. So anything that we can do with state and local government to identify areas where people are being trafficked, uh, provide information and support for folks who want to get out of the business and just making the public more aware of how, um, how much trafficking is going on along the I-5 corridor will help. I also believe that the work that we have done for notifications for missing and murdered indigenous women I'm not saying that they're all trafficked, but I am saying that sometimes they can also be trafficked. And so any of that work that we can coordinate together um, will help to hopefully provide a safer space for people who have been forced into trafficking. All right, our next question comes to us from Jim. Kent and Auburn both have large Ukrainian communities. What did the legislature do to help the people of Ukraine? So I know that this is going to sound disappointing, but we asked our federal partners to do their part to help the folks of Ukraine. And what we are doing is increasing money to our local refugee resettlement um, organizations so that if Ukrainian and, um, excuse me, if Ukrainian refugees make it to Washington state, we have the resources available to house them and provide food and whatever else that they need um, in their time of need. It is a very difficult thing. You know, of course, we did pass resolutions to say what was going on was wrong. We wanted the Ukrainian folks, to, people to know both in state and nationally that we, and internationally, excuse me, that we are standing with them and we are witnessing, we are bearing witness to the atrocities and that we welcome them when they come here. I know this is a very frustrating time. Um, my sympathy goes out to the family members um, and to our staff who also have, um, some of our staff have family in Ukraine as well. So we are monitoring the situation. We are in touch with our federal partners. And what we have done here locally is to try to make sure that the refugee resettlement agencies have enough money to care for people if they are sent to Washington state. Our next question comes to us from Shams. Uh, I was pleased to see the uh, Office of Independent Investigation get passed. 
But without an independent prosecutor, it feels like we've left the job half done. Was there progress made this session on independent prosecutions? Unfortunately, no, there was not. There was a piece of legislation that was brought forth from the Fraternal Order of Police and the families and the coalition. And I was the sponsor of that legislation. We got to a place where we were in negotiation. We were told by the Attorney General's office that the legislation was not constitutionally sound. And we made a difficult decision to go back to the drawing board one more time. And I think that people sometimes understand as we do this legislative work that we don't always get it right the first time or the second time. Sometimes it takes years to pass legislation, but I would rather get it right and not have it struck down and not have any of um, any of the work we do undone than to tr just try to push something through because we have come this far. I think that having independent investigations and, and seeing how that plays out will help to inform us on what an independent prosecutor should look like. Although I am disappointed that we didn't pass a bill, I do believe that there is a positive as we see what happens with the cases that come through the independent investigations, we it can help to inform us on how to create a constitutionally legal independent prosecution um, office. And so we are still working on that. I too am disappointed that we were not successful. Our next question comes to us from Kirsten. What has the legislature done to help families cover the costs of childcare? Well, we have um, a bill. I want it, I, the name, why isn't it escaping me? I want it, it's not first steps, sorry. Um, so we have put in place, uh, and somebody look this up for me while I try to remember the name. What we have done is we have put in place uh, training for child care providers. And what was most important was an increased amount of money that they receive from the state for state funded child care slots so that they can serve more children. We also have paid so that if we are going to impose um, the COVID restrictions on the child care provider, they can take fewer children. If they take fewer children, it is harder for them to make a living. So we have increased the amount of pay that they receive. And we have tried to provide them with um, the protective equipment, cleaning supplies and masks and all of those things. And although we know that the pandemic has turned to an endemic, we also know that in some of the areas where you see um, increase in COVID is where people congregate together. So as long as we can keep protocols where people have distance, people are masked and areas are kept clean, we hope that when we return to child care as it used to be, um, we will not have children getting COVID. And so we are trying to fund all of the external things that would impact child care so that the child care provider can still continue to provide a healthy, loving environment for learning and growth for children um, as their parents have to work and children are outside the home. We've also provided support for parents who are not outside the home, but just really believe that they need a little bit more support we have funded what we call a warm line where a parent can call in if they feel, if they have any questions at all. And there is um, a peer support and there are professionals who will answer those calls and provide parents with the resources that they need. Um, and, and actually um, sometimes they will accompany them as well um, so that they can determine if their child has a developmental delay, has a behavioral health issue, if they're progressing typically. Um, sometimes we know as parents, especially new parents, we are often worried about how our child develops. And so 
compared to other children. So is my child developing typically? And so there are just resources to help parents who have decided or, or who would like to stay home for the first part of their child's life to help them as well. So we're not just trying to help children who are in childcare, which we think is important, but we would like to help parents overall if that is something that they want to participate in. None of this is mandatory for uh, the parent training or the warm line. It's just a service that is available to parents. All right, and that, uh, the first act was the Fair Start for Kids Act. Thank you, Peter. I Sorry, it just, I kept on thinking first steps and that was something that happened years ago. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's what happens when you've been doing this work for a while. The Fair Start for Kids Act, yes. So that's what, that's what we're doing. Thank you, Peter. Absolutely. Our next question comes from Steve. Will you support a reduction to the gas tax? So, you know, we often get this question about a reduction to the gas tax, and we also get the same people who complain about how bad our roads are, how we don't do road maintenance. Right now, we fund through the gas tax road maintenance, and we just cannot afford a reduction in the gas tax. I have been... Um, Many community members have advocated for a reduction in the gas tax because of the increase in the price of gas, but we fund vital um, maintenance and operations through that. And we as a state at this particular time can't afford to have a reduction in the gas tax. Uh, a follow-up to that question is, will you support a road usage charge for electric vehicles or all vehicles? So this is really interesting. So, so a road usage charge, also some people will call it a ruck. You'll have people talking about what a ruck is. So right now we have many electric vehicles on the road and they don't pay the gas tax, but they use the road. And as we try to switch over to more electric vehicles so that we can have a cleaner environment, we have to have a way for the vehicles that use the roads to pay for the roads. And one way is a road usage charge or a ruck. And so given that electric vehicles are still on the road and we still have to maintain them, and although they aren't uh, putting uh, any sort of pollutants in the air, they're still using the road. I think that there should be a way that we can charge people who use the roads, including electric vehicles for that service so that they can help to pay for maintenance. So yes, I would support a RUC. Excellent. Our next question comes to us from Kat. Uh, what's one bill you have introduced or voted on that people may not know about? One bill that I have introduced. Um, so when I first got to the legislature, my very first year, I worked on a bill with, so Senator Wynn had a bill to improve TANF and I had a bill to improve TANF. And when we went to um, work on those, work on that legislation, a lot of the work that is in the bill is, is, is the language of the bill that I proposed. That happens in the legislature often. We also did that on um, the privacy bill we had a facial recognition, the use of facial recognition. I work with Senator Wynn and the, you know, I, I always think about that's my bill um, that was the final bill that was passed in the legislature. Facial recognition software is not, is something that I wanted us to have a moratorium on because the facial recognition was not working effectively. And when I say that it was misidentifying Black African American people um, at numbers that were just astronomical. It could not tell a Black woman from a Black man, and there were problems with the algorithm. Many in the profession were saying, well, the more you use it, the better it is. But if we were using it in law enforcement, we could not wait for a test to occur. We needed it to be effective and efficient before we engage in using it. And so I was opposed to having uh, the use of facial recognition software. And so the bill that I 
proposed did pass and there was a moratorium. So that is one. And then there's a bill that started as a pilot that has grown. But when I started it, I wanted to have a pilot and we did four community colleges because I'm on the board of Renta Technical College. And we had a number of students who were, um, and this was before COVID. So think about before COVID. I know for some of us, it seems like so long ago, but we had a pilot for emergency funds for students. When we had a number of students at RTC who were great students and all of a sudden they would leave school. And when we followed up, you know, some of them were leaving school because they had car trouble or some of them were leaving school because they were just short on their rent and they needed to work more. And then of course, if you leave school for a certain amount of time, you have to start repaying your student loans. So they would get in this vicious cycle of, if I can just get rid of this one, one debt, I can come back to school and do what I need to do. And so we piloted a program for students with need to be able to have a certain amount. You know, of course it's proven that they that they had issues, but um, so that they could stay in school and finish. And that now is being expanded and has been expanded. And that also included support for um, food service. Because what we learned um, at our college was, yes, there was a food pantry, but we, we had um, families who had significant food insecurity issues. And although it is kind for people to donate food um, so that their colleagues and classmates um, are not food insecure, we know we serve a population of students who had food insecurity. And so we thought that our colleges and all of our colleges now have food pantries and are doing food security work for all of their students. Because one, not everybody has a meal plan, um, which some four-year colleges and universities have, two-year colleges, to my knowledge, do not. And not everybody is food secure because what we learned from doing our need work with the with the proposal that I had, we learned about the number of homeless students that we have attending our colleges and universities, including University of Washington and others, um, where they are living in their cars, showering in the gym, um, sometimes being able to use a laundromat, sometimes their friends will allow them to use the laundry in one of the dorms, and they are simply trying to do what we have asked them to do which is finish school and get a good job. And so if we can provide help for students who have worked really hard and are continuing to try to do the best that they can by finishing college, um, it is one of the bills that um, I am most proud of that started out as a pilot and now has expanded to wraparound services for students in most of our colleges and universities, but definitely the 34 community and technical colleges. So our next question comes to us from Aaron. What do legislators work on during the interim period between sessions? Well, some legislators, excuse me, some legislatures are full, it's a full-time job, but in our legislature, it's a part-time job. So many legislators have other work that they do, um, working in small businesses, working for different counties or municipalities, uh, you know, working in any community, any job that you could think of, they are out there doing. Um, and they are also very dependent on their staff to hold down their district offices, answer questions, write letters, and um, have limited communication with their staff because they are back at their full-time work. Of course, um, they're also farmers. I can't, I'm thinking of Representative Dent, I don't wanna leave him out. They are farmers and, um, and uh, other things too in Eastern Washington. So, and they're bankers and they're uh, landlords. Um, so we have a number of different things that folks do when they're during the interim. I am, uh, I have the opportunity to just simply be a legislature. So my interim, I work three days a week on community issues. Um, my Derek and Peter and others on the staff help me to schedule meetings, attend community events, and just keep myself informed about what's going on in community. Um, folks can reach out to my office during the interim. 
I tried to have um, community meetings. This was all before COVID. I do often meet folks for coffee at a local cafe in Kent and talk about issues. Um, so we meet with community members, advocacy groups. We I also meet with lobbyists. I know that some people don't, but I do. Um, and I just try to make myself available and hopefully uh, with staff to craft legislation that will be ready for the next legislative session. Our next question comes to us from Gerald. California and Virginia are two states that have taken steps to regulate how companies use the data they collect on us. Is Washington considering a bill to regulate uh, data privacy? You know, um, we have been working on a data privacy bill for a number of years. The last bill that was moved forward in the House was with Representative Slatter and Representative Berg. I thought that that was a really good compromise, but it did not make it over the threshold. We want to um, regulate data privacy. I think Washington is in a particular um, space because we have so many of the tech industries in our state. I believe we have open communication with those industries. And I believe we can, I believe that we can come to an agreement. Um, I think it will be interesting to see what happens at the federal level. Some have proposed that we shouldn't have individual states having their own privacy laws. It should be left up to the federal level. Um, but I think we can really help inform uh, any federal legislation by doing things here in Washington state before uh, the federal government comes down with a proposal. And so I'd like to see us continue to work on data privacy, on the monetization of who we are, quote unquote, as consumers and have more information and less um, monetization. Um, there is the story that people made it um, very um, easy for me to understand. Is your dry cleaner a dry cleaner? Or is your dry cleaner a person who is collecting data to monetize that data? And I was thinking, well, what do you mean is my dry cleaner a dry cleaner? I, I think of my dry cleaner as the dry cleaner. Um, but in some cases, people start businesses for the idea of gathering data on the purchaser, not necessarily to sell the item that the purchaser is buying. Gathering the data on the purchaser, the data can be monetized and others make a tremendous amount of money off of monetizing that data. The consumer, the purchaser should know who is buying that information, who is selling that information, what information is known about them. We, we often will say, excuse me, we often are told that all the data is anonymous, but you can go and find almost anywhere that with anonymous data, people can find out all kinds of information about you in a very short period of time. So there has to be some privacy. Um, we did not give up our privacy to be a part of the marketplace. So I think we do need to have some regulation on our likeness, our images and information about us. We should know what is happening, how that information is being used. And if it's being monetized, and if you or I decide that that's okay, but we wanna get paid, I think that there should be a way for us to get paid for providing all of that information because others are making a lot of money off of what we are consuming and how we are consuming it. Our next question comes to us from Casey. How can students be involved in the legislative process? Well, I think that there are a number of ways that students can be involved in the legislative process. So before COVID, we used to have um, students who could come down and be a page so they, so they 
have school, but they also learn how the legislature works by assisting members of the legislature. I always um, recommend that you work, you look at an issue that is important to you, and then you can use the legislative services to find out um, just by simply searching for a keyword if there is a bill that is being proposed for the next legislative session on that issue. Those bills will have a bill number and you can follow that bill through the process. You can, if you want to, testify for or against a piece of legislation. You can write in or right now um, during the legislative session, we have remote testimony. So you can sign up and use Zoom to do remote testimony. Um, I think that that is a great way for you to understand how what we do at, at the in the state legislature, but you also have your city council meetings. And I know that there are a few councils now who are inviting and creating youth councils. So in your local community, you may want to check and see if like the city of Kent, city of Covington, city of Auburn have a youth council. I know at one time they did, but you know, COVID has made so many changes in what we do and how we do work in our communities. Um, that is another way for you to learn about the legislative process. And um, I believe it is the YMCA has a, a youth and government program that um, I, we have had a number of young people who come and, and they participate in a mock legislature. And they, I think it's through the Y. And so if there's a local Y in your community, you can learn about the youth and government program there. Gives you an idea of how the legislature works because you pretend to be a legislator. And we have had, um, we have been able to witness some of those young people coming down. Of course, this was all before COVID but um, to be a legislator for the day. And it was really fascinating. So those are some of the things that you can do. Excellent. Well, it looks like that is all the time we have for questions tonight. Thank you to everyone who took the time to participate in tonight's virtual town hall. I'm now gonna turn it back over to Representative Entman for closing remarks. And and ask questions. I hope that I was able to answer your questions effectively. You can always write to me at deborah.intonman at leg.wa.gov. Um, that is my email address. I try to, during the interim, actually um, write letters and have responses. Uh, and of course, I have meetings if there is a meeting request. So um, during this time, I would love to be able to continue to communicate with you. I always um, tell people that I might not always agree with you and you might not always agree with me, but um, everyone wants to be heard. And so I respect your right to petition your legislator. I will try to give you an honest answer. Um, I will not always agree with you, but I will try to respond. So thank you for participating tonight in the town hall. I look forward to speaking with you or meeting with you or writing with you, excuse me, writing back to you if you write to me um, so we can talk about how to improve the lives of the families that live in the 47th. Thank you for participating in my town hall. <laughs>